Yes, thank you so much, Brian. And thank you for doing this. And all of your guests, you have some amazing panelists who are here as they talk about what the 2020 presidential election means to the borough of Brooklyn. And Brooklyn is the microcosm of the entire country. And let's be clear, no matter what happens in uh, November on election day, it is not the ending, it's just the beginning. Uh, the conditions we have been living under came long before the current president. Uh, it has been here for a long time. The inefficiencies have basically led to inequalities across our entire country and our bor borough. But I'm proud of the over 100,000 Brooklynites leading the entire city who turned out for early voting. Uh, we are fighting to really save our country. When you look at the infrastructure, $16 billion in MTA capital needs, 9,000 families, individual, 9,000 individuals who are impacted by lead and NYCHA, over proliferation of gun violence. Every night we're hearing of those Southern state guns playing out on our street corners in our community, the issues around law enforcement abuse, uh, women rights issues uh, that we're going to face with the rights of women to decide what they're going to do with their bodies and the rights of LGBTQ to decide who they're going to marry and love. These are important issues and I'm hoping tonight that your listeners will understand that we must be fully engaged as your panelists talk about their points of views and their decision. It is all right. We don't have to speak in one tone and one voice, but we have to agree that this country must be open to everyone to participate and have a true understanding of what it is to be part of a dream that has lived out as a nightmare for far too many Americans and Brooklynites on the whole. Thank you again, Brian, for hosting this. Brick has been a leading voice around these important topics, and I'm really pleased that I'm able to give you opening comments. <laughs> As, as evidenced by historic levels of early voter turnout, civic engagement is at an all-time high. For many communities here in Brooklyn, the need to be heard during the 2020 presidential election cycle may feel like a matter of life and death. We watch the news and the debates, yet still find ourselves asking, what does the national election have to do with us? The 91-year-old grandmother of the producer of this very show tonight is in Clinton Hill, sharing that she's never lived through anything as intense as the current climate right here in the U.S. Amid a global pandemic, she is more than committed than ever to casting her ballot in this presidential election, albeit an absentee ballot via postal mail sent two weeks ago. We are in what many hope is a once in a lifetime moment. This evening, we're sharing that moment with you. In our own version of the smoke-filled back room, convening a Brooklyn caucus to examine the issues most pressing in our borough and establish Brooklyn's political platform. Now for the next 90 minutes, let's craft the agenda that best represents Brooklyn. I'll be relying on your input and working through the issues with our invited panel, which I'm so happy to introduce to you right now. Here with us this evening in the room via Zoom or whatever platform you're watching is Mahogany L. Brown, author, organizer, and educator, one of our favorite multi-hyphenates who hosts the most popular night in Brooklyn at the Brooklyn Poetry Slam right at Brick House. Thank you for being with us tonight, Mahogany. We're also happy to welcome into our discussion, Michelle De La Uz, the Executive Director of the Fifth Avenue Committee, a tremendous organization serving more than 5,500 low and moderate income folks all throughout our area. I'm also happy to have Ray Gomes here tonight. Ray is a food justice activist organizer and writer and the Community Health Network Manager at the Red Hook Initiative. Great to see you tonight, Ray. And an old friend of the network, Randy Pierce, so happy to have you back on our airwaves again. Randy is here tonight in his capacity as the President 
and CEO of the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce. And with that brings decades of workforce and economic development experience and expertise to our borough and the world. Thanks for joining us, Randy. And Nadia Lopez, the Lopez Effect founder is here. She's an educator and educational activist and a former principal at the much lauded Mott Hall Bridges Academy in Brooklyn. So glad to see you on the airwaves in Brooklyn again, Ms. Principal Lopez. Thanks for joining us. So this is our panel tonight. This is our community and we're going to be working through some issues. Now we are working with one conceit. We know that we've seen you standing in line waiting to vote as the borough president said, at least 100,000 of us voted early already. Knowing that all of these issues are of supreme importance to Brooklyn. We've been out on the street as well as polling the folks who I just introduced you to to ask them what they see as the issues that are driving Brooklyn forward and really making us come to the polls, come to community board meetings, school board meetings, block club meetings, any kind of meeting that you can have. When activists are called, Brooklynites are showing up, knowing that there is a hierarchy of need and knowing that there's also only so many hours in the day. So tonight we've come to a bargain. We're bringing six issues to the front and asking each of our panelists to sort of give us a full view to decide which of the three issues will make it to the main planks of the Brooklyn platform as we look at what it could mean to be the Brooklyn for president. So, as I said, we were out on the streets and we got some idea about what folks were interested in and we're gonna be sharing some of those things with you throughout the night, but to begin, we're going to be looking at the issue of education and infrastructure and the economy. So on that speed, let's make sure that you are heard. Make sure that you're commenting on whatever platform you're watching us in, and we'll be incorporating those comments and questions for our panelists and everyone at home. But we did do some homework out on the street, finding out what people were interested in talking about and what they would do if they were elected president. Have a look. My name is Emily. I'm from Park Slope, Brooklyn. Um, if I were president, I would make public education much stronger than it is now so that every kid had an equal opportunity to have the best education possible. So that was just a little bit about education, a cursory glance at one of the most pressing issues, especially as we're going into new realm of things and facing educational challenges that we couldn't have anticipated just a few months ago. And there happens to be someone here, of course, who has a vested interest in education and even founded a new outlook, Nadia Lopez. I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself right now and tell us why education deserves to be the central plank on this Brooklyn platform. Hi, Brian, it's so good to see you. And I'm excited to be on this panel with so many dynamic um, speakers. But listen, you know, for me, Brooke, um, education is everything. Education is the hub of the community. And even right now, as we sit in the midst of a pandemic, when the schools close, the entire world had to stop, right? And that spoke volumes about how important our education system is, but also how broken it is because our children weren't prepared to be online. Our educators weren't prepared to teach online. Um, we know that there are going to be people who are gonna talk about various parts that seem important and they are in terms of this national election. But for those children who lacked housing securities, who were living in homeless shelters, who were living in temporary housing, it was nearly impossible to get them the Wi-Fi, the technology that they needed, the access on time so that they could be on board. Um, when we think about the fact that healthcare is a number one issue, myself included, um, the reason why I even had to take a step back and resign from my position is because of the fact that all the stress-related things that I went through at work I was not allowed um, the opportunity of getting the best health care because I was forced to stay in Brooklyn. And I, I got to see a bird's eye view of what the disparities are in our health care system. And the first thing that I thought of was all of my children who go through these um, different clinics, 
who have to see these different doctors who take who don't take them into consideration. I've been to too many funerals with too many parents or too many parents who have died because of lack of education. We need to prioritize teaching in our schools about health and nutrition, not through health classes, but actually teaching our children, just not, not making hydroponic um, uh, a club. It needs to be part of the mandatory curriculum. We need to teach our children the importance of eating greens and teaching them how to cook them. Because it's one thing to have the conversation, but many of them don't cook them. We had to open up and create our own garden at our school. By doing that, we were able to teach our children about the various types of ways that they can plant things and the things that they could cook. Something as simple as squash. There were um, seniors at a senior center. I remember uh, this senior, she was 93 years old. And when she saw the squash, she started to cry. And I, I, I couldn't understand what, why she was so emotional. And she said to me, baby, I haven't seen this since I was in North Carolina 50 years ago. And for many of our families that we sent home squash so that the kids could cook at home, they, the parents sent it back. And they said to me, Ms. Opus, we don't know how to cook this. Like you sending us stuff that we don't eat in our household. So we had to start creating a curriculum where we have to teach our children about health and nutrition in a different way. Because Brownsville is one of the poorest neighborhoods in New York City, we made it mandatory that our children learn about entrepreneurship and financial literacy, right? It's mandatory, it's not an option because we understand that in, with situations in terms of poverty, when our children lack the knowledge of creating right? As opposed to being the consumers, they need to be producers. We change the trajectory of what can happen to them in their future. And as to, in terms of our, um, we're in a moment of a racial uprising, right? There's a lot of tension, but it's also because our education system lacks the audacity to teach history as it's supposed to be taught. Um, not just making the black experience about slavery and the civil rights movement, but really teaching about our, teaching our children about they come from revolutionaries. They come from individuals who have made significant changes and have developed resilience, right? And if we teach them those things, then we have a different outlook for our children and their future. So for me, education is where we need to make the most impact because not only when we teach a child are we changing their future, but we're also changing the landscape of an entire family and generations to come. So I know we just have, uh, in the interest of equal time before we go to the next subject, I wanted to ask you about one thing from education that should fall away that we don't want to bring with us onto the platform because everyone might not have the same idea of what constitutes an education right now as evidenced by a guy in Washington who's trying to shape some curricula right now. But what thing would you want to see us leave behind from the way that education has been focused on in our city? Um, we need to go beyond just assessments. I think that that's really, really important. Um, there's such a heavy emphasis on assessments. And the reality is that um, they're created by companies and individuals who are not in our classrooms. And we need to meet our children where they're at. And once we do that, we don't have to rush along and try to force every child to fit into a box. What we do is we see them for who they are. We build throughout their time being, you know, passionate young individuals and focusing on, focusing on them in a holistic manner. So just to be clear, we started with you in education and this is the beauty of our panel and the minds that we've invited. You might think we were going to be in a narrow lane about reading, writing, and arithmetic, but we got a view of how education is such a cornerstone and it touches health access and education about even food and looking at financial literacy and teaching a history that is reflective and inclusive and uh, will go a long way towards this moment of racial reckoning that we're in right now, arming children with their real histories. And just taking all of that into account, I wanted to remind everyone who's watching that we understand that these are all important issues and they all have intersections where they come together. And this is the most unfair question that we're asking tonight of which of these things should be first. But taking in that holistic view, I'm looking at you, Randy, right now. 
after hearing that impassioned and really well-developed 360 degree view of what an education can mean for people in Brooklyn right now to come and weigh in with what infrastructure and the economy need and can do to forward that very issue that Nadia and so many of the other subheadings brought to the floor. So Randy, it's yours. Tell us why the economy and infrastructure should be um, Brian, the central plank. Well, the economy and infrastructure, well, thank you, Brian. Um, I, I Listen, I agree with a lot of what Nadia said and there's a, there's a direct correlation between uh, education attainment and the economy. Uh, and that's uh, unquestionable. But let's talk a little bit about the landscape of Brooklyn's economy. Uh, we are the largest borough by people for sure, um, but we are a small business economy. 84% uh, of our 63,000 businesses have less than 10 employees. Uh, and if you think about small businesses being the economic engine for the United States uh, and the number one job creator, uh, I mean, I think it becomes a central point uh, for Brooklyn. And one of the ways that we uh, continue to grow our local economy is through infrastructure invest investments. So there's a, there's a clear sort of uh, intertwined track between infrastructure investments and our small business economy. So if you think about whether it's transportation infrastructure like our roads and our bridges, whether it's something as mundane as replacement of sewers and resiliency uh, projects that will assist long-term in protecting us from climate change. I mean, all of this is really part uh, of infrastructure investment. We like to also think of infrastructure investment in terms of just brick and mortar, but it's also access to broadband uh, and how, you know, especially access to broadband now that we're all on Zoom and we're all working from home and we need that access. We need that access throughout all corners of Brooklyn. And there are too many corners of Brooklyn that have been underserved by technology, that have been underserved by broadband. Uh, so these are the parts of infrastructure that not only help grow your economy and add to employment, but they actually support all, all parts of your life, uh, whether it's resiliency, roads and bridges, uh, broadband infrastructure. But getting back to our small business economy, uh, the connection as well to education is just what Nadia said. It's about entrepreneurship, it's about financial literacy, and it's about showing uh, the people of Brooklyn, especially our young people. And you know, Brian, for 10 years, I, I, I ran the largest youth workforce development organization in New York City, working with our disconnected youth population. But entrepreneurship uh, is a path uh, for our youth uh, to really move ahead, uh, and, it ex and it really shows their creativity. Uh, so there's so many tie-ins here, and it's almost like unfair to have us pick between education and the economy slash infrastructure because it really is uh, very much uh, interconnected. Brooklyn is the hub now uh, for the creative economy. Brooklyn is second only to San Francisco in terms of new tech startups. Uh, Brooklyn has a diversity of, of uh, industries from healthcare, which is one of our largest sectors, uh, our retail corridors, which I've just spent, quite honestly, the last four months touring uh, our retail corridors all across the borough. Uh, you know, I've done 25 of these tours. Last one was Monday in Cypress Hills. So, you know, the economy is about jobs and opportunity. It's about entrepreneurship. It's also about help, helping our minority uh, and women-owned business enterprises and our immigrant-owned business enterprises to move ahead uh, and to achieve uh, both the American dream, but also uh, to be part of the equation of helping to pull up communities, right? Because, you know, if you're a successful entrepreneur from any particular community, and if you can hire locally, and if you could support that local community, then the return on that investment is extraordinary. So from my perspective, yes, I'm a Chamber of Commerce guy. I don't think we should have to pick between education and the economy because they're so intertwined. But uh, I do say uh, the economy, especially our infrastructure investments, are going to be such an important part of all of our lives in a very holistic way here in Brooklyn. So that's why I'm supporting uh, the economy and infrastructure. So thank you for that perspective. We have someone who actually uh, we met on the streets of Brooklyn who may be aligned with your views. Let's check that video. My name is Derek and I'm from this neighborhood, Clinton Hill. If I were president, I think the first thing I would start with is I'd have a plan for COVID, which would naturally lead me into 
an economic recovery plan. And then I figure out the best way to move this country forward so that everybody has an opportunity to be successful. Certainly would not be pardoning you know who is in office now. Take care. Take care. Well, all the you know who's aside, we've heard from two Brooklynites who are just sharing their day and it was uh, interrupted by me putting a microphone in their face and two of our panelists on the issue. So now I would love to hear from the rest of you about those intersections that you see between education and the economy or where you might be leaning before we put it to a vote for the panel and for the people of Brooklyn. So all of your mics are open. Let us know if you uh, have a thought. Mahogany, I saw yours disappear first. You got something to say? Um, I was just gonna say, I am definitely Team Lopez effect. Uh, education <laughs> is the bedrock and there is no other way. If we don't have the tools to not only understand where we're coming from, we won't know where we're going to. And the fact that uh, she's not only engaged with um, uh, gardening and urban planning and uh, understanding how foods are very much a part of not just how your home is, but how your mind works. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, that's the ecosystem right there in itself. But let me queer the narrative a little. It's important to have your education going, but what about the crumbling schools and the subway and the sewers that are creating a hazard to the young people who may not benefit from the fullness of great people like Nadia because the city is crumbling around them. How are they getting to school on those broken roads and messed up commuter system? Michelle. I, I just want to say that you know education to me is part of the infrastructure. There's, there's physical infrastructure and then there's human infrastructure and they're both critically important and they both need investment. And if you don't have one investment without the other, it, 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 you know, the city will not prosper. So I, I don't know. I'm definitely not an either or person. I'm a both and kind of person, <laughs> personally. Yeah, all of the both and people, I see you in the comments, but we got to pick one tonight for the purposes of this exercise. Remember, this is the smoke-filled room. We're in back now. There's a whole stadium full of people out there ready to say, we're going to win this thing. And they're waiting for our three policy planks. So this is the unfair bargain that we're called upon to make tonight. So it's well, if, I, be... if, I, if you had to narrow it that way, I would just say that from a presidential perspective, I mean, you know, how many times have we heard in the presidential election people saying that there, we were ready, there was a bipartisan support for an infrastructure bill? Yeah. Um, so I don't know, maybe that's the thing that can help bring the country together right now. Well, so and we the BQE need... is still falling into the ocean. So... It's time for our first vote. In just a few seconds, our panelists will be seeing the options before them. It's either going to be the choice between education or the economy slash infrastructure. So I'm going to ask you to lock in right now. And while our panelists are taking part and making their vote, I'm going to encourage you to let us know what you think. What would you come down on? So I hear in my ear now that we have a winner and it seems it wasn't a hard choice by the speed of the way the vote came in, but education it is. <laughs> the Lopez effect is in full effect, our first victory of the night, but the victory really is for Brooklyn. We know that you've been watching and involved in this political stuff going back and forth. There won't be any raised voices or cut off microphones here tonight because we're engaging with civil people who instead of putting themselves first, always in their words and deeds have put our community first. And that's why they're here. And we hope that's why you're here in the service of moving us all forward together in the best way. So education is the first plank of the Brooklyn platform. So we are just going a little bit forward now into the next round. Food insecurity is something that many Brooklynites were struggling with before this pandemic and certainly as we're in the midst of it. What a lot of us knew is becoming apparent and very apparent to some others who are just finding out. 
As a matter of fact, the national survey recently said two in 10 people have sought emergency food supplements where they'd never been in that position before. That's two in 10 Americans on a national scale have shown up looking for emergency food. We know that it is a very serious problem and we are aiming to look beyond emergency food into real structural change and food justice. And Ray Gomes, I think you may have something to say on the subject. Just a couple of things, just, just. The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here, be a part of this esteemed panel. Um, specifically to represent food, because I think it's such a crucial aspect of our lives and it, it's not getting talked about in a way that I think is moving us towards really solving a lot of the issues that are com our communities face. Um, you know, I think food should be on this platform because we all eat, we all need to eat. And one of the things that, you know, this pandemic definitely brought to the forefront was that food is the first thing that people, hunger is the first thing really that people experience when there's a crisis, right? You go to the food pantry, you go and you look for emergency food sources, right? And even though hunger is the experience, the cause is poverty, the cause is the loss of income, right? And so a lot of what I am proposing is really looking at the root causes of what co of, of hunger, the root causes of um, lack of food access in the community um, and then really thinking through and I apologize I'm going to do this a lot making Hamilton references because I love Hamilton <laughs> who is in the room where it happens right that is the main concern that I have here because we're talking about policy we're talking about the presidential elections and for the most part, people who look like me, people who look like a lot of our panelists aren't in the room where it happens. We aren't, we aren't the ones that are making these decisions that are would reflect best and long-term solutions for our communities, right? Um, so the, the, the proposals that I have are really about looking at kind of taking a bigger picture view of how a lot of the response around COVID-19 has happened and how a lot of these things basically further a lot of the inequities and how we can sort of redirect to a better co course. And, you know, I'm very heartened by the fact that, you know, Ms. Lopez mentioned, um, you know, nutrition, food and nutrition education as part of, you know, her education platform. And that's why I support it education platform um also you know but i would go further and say you know i just want to put this as an aside but i would go further and say that food justice should be a part of that that nutrition education that is not just necessarily about you know you know the 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 you know my plate and all of these other things and 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 having vegetables and fruits and all of that but it's also understanding you know why we have um, a lack of good food access in our communities you know i i think that young people in particular will be very um, interested to know the roots of those issues because a lot of them will motivate them to activism so I just wanted to add that. Um, so I think for the most part, a lot of what happened around COVID food response was an, a heavy investment in emergency food. And as Brian mentioned, um, that statistic about a lot of people accessing emergency food resources who had never um, accessed it before, we see that, you know, that had sort of been the ready sort of um, application or the ready, the, the ready re way that people responded to that need and the ready way that our government, our city government, our state government and our federal government um, provided relief for our communities. And, you know, as was mentioned before, our communities have been facing these issues long before COVID, right? And so if emergency food resources is the only way that we sort of look at any so type of food access resource, then we're constantly in this cycle of only funding those efforts, right? Mm -hmm. And so COVID really, 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 really made it so that that argument is at the forefront of most, if not everything um, that we're doing in terms of food security. And so one of my platform um, ideas is to divest from the emergency food industrial complex because believe it is an emergency food industrial complex. It's these huge corporations that get millions and billions of dollars of our tax money in order to respond to this crisis that gets supposedly trickle down to our communities, but can be invested in a better way. So divest out of that complex and 
complex and invest in community food sovereignty projects. And there is a way that you could respond to the emergency food needs and uh, leverage that response to these long-standing sustainable efforts, right? There are a lot of different models for that in the community that if the, the city agencies were sort of bringing those people <laughs> into the room where it happens, where those decisions were being made, our food response would look a lot different. Um, so one of the things that we need to do is invest and create a food and equity council made of these community food sovereignty and, and community um, partners who have been doing this work for a very long time. Um, there's also the, a huge divestment that has been happening for about a century um, in terms of food in this country. And that divestment is in Black land ownership. Our Black farmers have been dispossessed of their land um, for over 100 years through a consistent government policy and government subsidized, well, or, or basically government turning a blind eye to a lot of violence, um, state, and it was basically state-sanctioned violence against Black farmers. And so as a way to sort of look at this sort of long lens view, this sort of big picture view, um, you know, how do we respond to the loss of Black land and the lack of access in our Black communities, we create a network where Black farmers are feeding Black communities. And so you work in a way, and you know, this is not sort of like a sort of easy sort of solve to all our issues. It's an idea, it's an investment in both way, in both um, lack, um, sort of dispossession, um, dispossession in urban landscapes of good food access, dispossession in rural landscapes of land, right? And so we're working to solve that with, with, with applying those two frameworks. One of the ways that I would respond to one of my panelists in terms of thinking um, of infrastructural, um, um, infrastructural investment is that, you know, there are ways that infrastructural investment could really, really go awry. Um, you know, during the 1968 riots, right? When people, Black communities were basically responding to uh, police violence in their communities, you know, government, small business association, all these agencies sort of gathered people together and asked them, all right, what do you want? What do you want? And they said everything. They said they want health equity. They want better education for their families. They want better access to food in the community. They want more businesses, more entrepreneurs opportunities. So they said, okay, businesses. And so they ran with that. And you know what businesses they supported? Fast food restaurants, right? And so now we see the result of that. In post 1970s, you know, when we think about coming to America, that movie and all of that, and this sort of central black family that built that wealth from fast food restaurants, that was a direct result of policy. That was a direct result of people saying, we're supporting black people to have black ownership in businesses. Julian Bond, Muhammad Ali, those are some, and a, a host of other athletes were entrepreneurs, black entrepreneurs for fast food restaurants. And right. so when we think about what we have in terms of food swamps, that was a direct investment of infrastructural and inc economic investment that has led to um, black businesses thriving, but also being very detrimental to community health and food access in the community. So, so we're going from the Lopez effect in education to the McDowell's effect in the way that <laughs> community has been impacted when you ask for something and then something was delivered and it wasn't quite what we need exactly especially as we build sustainable healthy communities for exactly generations. exactly so, taking all of that into account i do have to um let everyone in the broader audience know that we invited jose albino uh from the griot circle one of our great friends uh, and neighbors uh, just near us at Brick that deals with intersectionality and specifically in provi providing community and support for our older LGBTQIA plus uh, family members and citizens to come together and uh, have an opportunity to fellowship and get healthy food and community. So Jose was scheduled to be here this evening, but at the last minute, could not make it. And he was in the uh, bad position of having to uh, sort of make some counterpoints against Ray for how community investment should be plowed into a space of healthcare. 
end. As we can see, these issues are tied together. As a matter of fact, on YouTube, uh, Neil Feldman, who's watching, thank you, uh, left a comment and said, these issues are interrelated. We must bring together decision makers, close the door and not let them come out without a progressive solution to these never ending problems, which is what we've done. So call your congressperson, Neil, and let them know that Brick is on the case and we've invited the smartest people we know into the room. Right, so, just just one, one, one quick thing. I mean, I'm so happy that, you know, someone was gonna talk about healthcare. As you know, my position is to think about community health. Community right. health is directly related to food access as evidenced by multiple studies. Um, and then my, my last point was really to invest in social determinants of health priority areas and have, you know, look at the, va the basic social determinants of health, um, redlining, areas who have historically been redlined, areas mm -hmm. that have high levels of gentrification, they all have very horrible health outcomes. And so to have those as high priority areas for investment in right. healthcare, food included. So Ray, can you just draw the line for me for a second? Because some people are listening to you talk about these determinants and may not quite see how one thing links to the other. But this isn't, this isn't theoretical. This is something that we know to be the case. Yes, um, I would use the example of uh, my, my old job at the health department. We would have these maps that we would work with um, and it essentially will be overlays of different um, statistics. So it'll be like all the areas who, have, who um, have been historically redlined, right? And redlining is a government sanctioned program that basically determined which community would have investment through loans and credit um, in, or in order to own the property. And then that also extends into a lot of different things in terms of what how communities would be invested in period right um, and so historically red lines communities are ones with the highest uh, um, outcomes uh, negative health outcomes in terms of you know I don't necessarily like using obesity as something because that's sort of loaded in a lot of ways but you know in terms of you know um, obesity or 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 neg um, I'm sorry uh, uh, Pre premature death, thanks. <laughs> I'm trying to remember all my health department terminology. Um, you know, um, anything that you think in terms of negative health outcomes, all of these um, communities have them. It, it's like really just like A equals B. Like it's the, the same right. communities, the same histories, um, and the same outcomes. And so, you know, when we talk about all the issues around healthcare and what makes good health, Yes. What makes good health is good housing. What makes good health is affordable housing. What makes good health is healthy access to good food. What makes good health is, is good access to, to quality education. What makes good health is, um, you know, access to healthcare um, resources in the community, both public health and medical care, right? And so for the areas that have been dispossessed of that of those resources through government action, whether direct or indirect, we need to respond in a policy way, in a in, because policy created it, policy has right. to answer it. We have to respond with policy and investment in these um, high priority areas and create the better health for these communities. Well, I can uh, say anyone, it's clear that Ray Gomes is arguing both sides of the issue. She came at it from a food justice perspective and she came at it from a purely healthcare perspective. And we're asking our panelists to meet in the middle. Again, we understand that it's an unfair conceit, but if we're looking at the hierarchy of need and also just the amount of resources that we humanly have in ourselves, if you've ever had to make the decision between going to the PTA meeting or going to the block club association or a community board and get dinner on the table or wash clothes, you know there's only so many hours in the day. So we understand that it's unfair. And a second ago, I misattributed uh, that quote that I said was from Neil, but it was also, it was actually from a former BRIC colleague, Ted Canova. Thanks for writing in, Ted. So that being said, and knowing that Jose was not here, we do have a uh, person on the street who's sharing their opinion of how they would make things happen if they were president with regards to healthcare. Have a look. Hi, I'm Dr. Archer, a child and adolescent psychiatrist. I work in Brownsville, Brooklyn. And if I were president, everybody would get free mental health care. 
everyone, from the youngest to the oldest. Hi, <laughs> my name is Dr. Aravel LaCroix Pembroke. I'm the principal of Riverdale Avenue Middle School. And if I were president, my priority for the first 100 days in office would be to offer free mental health services to every single citizen and undocumented person in the United States. it to the panel and it's a binary choice but it's a non-binary world we get that let me get the panel up right now with the poll and the question is what is the second plank of the brooklyn platform with the full knowledge that we have there looking at food justice issues or looking at health care so we have a winner and the winner is health care which were two sides of the same coin. No one lost here. And even if they only thought of healthcare as what happens in the hospital, surely they know that the food is your medicine right now. So thank you for the impassioned arguments, Ray. Thank you for the votes from our panelists. Thank you for your comments that I see uh, funneling in from folks all over Brooklyn. Hey, to the uh, folks at Collective Fair in Brownsville, who I got to spend a lot of time with this summer for the six week, six week, six part series, uh, Brownsville Rising, that's currently airing on Brick TV, where we talked with the community about some community comorbidities that were in place and how Brownsville is rising to the challenge and rising above the expectations of those who don't know that Brownsville is going to be better than it was coming into this thing, going out of it. So thanks to the folks at Brownsville uh, Collective Fair and the members of the community who welcomed us so robustly there. We really appreciate it and hope that you all will uh, watch and learn as we delve into some issues in Brownsville. But our issue ahead of us right now, that is something that was paramount for a lot of folks in Brownsville, which some people see as Brooklyn and New York City's last frontier as lots of plans are being made for that community. We're looking at housing, the whole housing landscape in Brooklyn. And we actually have a person who we met on the street where if they were a single issue voter, housing would be theirs. Have a look. I'm State Senator Brian Kavanaugh. And if I were president, I would ensure that every American has a right to decent, affordable housing. Uh, by strengthening our fair housing laws and by providing adequate funding for public housing and for affordable housing throughout the country. Affordable housing throughout the country was the last word that he left off on. And I know that affordable housing might be a third rail because affordable to who is how it starts. And then the question goes on from there. So Michelle De La Uz, You've already forgotten more about affordable housing development than most of us could hope to learn. So the floor is yours. Convince us as to why affordable housing and just housing period should be the last and wide policy plank as Brooklyn's caucus moves on. Sure, before I do that, I just wanna, um, I think, conjure the spirit of uh, former Congresswoman uh, Shirley Chisholm, the first, um, major uh, black party candidate for president. Um, since we, you know, we're here talking about Brooklyn's platform for president, I think it's important to, um, to bring her spirit into the room. I sure. um, as, as part of um, a part of talking about uh, housing and the importance of it, um, you know, right now, uh, people are holding on by a thread. The only reason why homelessness hasn't, um, a tsunami of homelessness has not hit this city and this borough is because of the eviction moratoriums that we have in place um, locally and federally. Um, we have, you know, an estimate um, from uh, a national organization that New York State has about a million renters um, that due to COVID alone will need $11 billion in rental assistance. Um, 
number of homeless families this evening um, hovers around 60,000 in, in the city of New York. Um, even before COVID hit, if you weren't homeless, um, you were rent burdened. You were paying well more than 30% of your income towards rent. And that obviously has only gotten worse as people have lost jobs. Um, so people are holding on by a thread. Um, and as Ray said, um, housing and housing stability and the quality of that housing is a major determinant of many different things in your life. It's a major determinant of whether or not you're healthy. It's a major determinant of, you know, whether or not uh, you, you're you stable enough to take part in education, right? Um, it's a major determinant of how long it takes you to get to work and what access to jobs that you have, right? So it, it's a major, major issue that um, impacts uh, New Yorkers, impacts Brooklynites, and quite honestly impacts folks throughout this country. This country has not done enough um, to make housing widely available to Americans overall. Um, and there's a long, long history of systemic racism as it relates to housing in this country. Um, Ray already brought up, uh, brought up redlining. We've talked, you know, you hear about the GI Bill and the fact that you know, who wasn't able to take advantage of that in order to build wealth. Um, and um, those, are, those are all things that can be undone um, if we have the political will um, and set our minds to it in, in terms of the level of intention and the scale of investment um, that is needed. You know, solutions, um, you know, first we need to recognize that housing is a human right. Um, you know, housing is not just a commodity. Um, housing can't be the only way that people build wealth and um, have a, a foothold um, in, in being part of our society. And, you know, a lot of that is about, um, you know, uh, writing the balance in, in terms of, uh, you know, providing real rental assistance, investing in public housing, uh, taking a look at that mortgage interest deduction and like, who does that benefit and who's not benefiting from that, you know, multi-billion dollar tax break that we're giving. Uh, to homeowners, most of whom are not black and brown in this country. Um, and, uh, and of course, you know, as the, the person said that, that spoke earlier um, from the street, you know, to affirmatively further fair housing. We, we had a fair housing act in this country, but we've never ever affirmatively furthered fair housing. What we've done is when there's been actual discrimination that we were, we we're reactive. Um, to the issues around housing and issues of discrimination, but the country's never actually affirmatively furthered fair housing. Um, when President Obama put out a rule to, to affirmatively further fair housing, the first thing that President Trump did when he got into office was to basically say, we don't really need that. And Ben Carson has, you know, repeatedly uh, trying to take steps um, to undermine any, any affirmatively further fair housing rules. New York City is doing more in that front. Um, so, uh, you know, these are all things why housing is so critical. H housing is absolutely, um, you know, part of the systemic reform um, and elevating housing as a human right. And what that means is part of the systemic reform that we as a country and as a society need to put forward to undo the systemic racism um, that we see uh, every day um, in, in the lives of many, many people and, and, and how, quite honestly, how this pandemic is also playing out. You know, people who live in overcrowded conditions, it's not density that is driving, um, you know, COVID numbers, uh, at least in, in a lot of the neighborhoods in New York City where there, there's um, higher in, infection rates, it's, it's overcrowded housing conditions um, that, are, that are driving that. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there and vote for housing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we like that last minute plug in there in the spirit of the vote. Uh, I do want to bring something. We, we're having a robust discussion over on the YouTube page and Mo Beasley left a comment. How do we fight the engineers of systematic, systemic oppression? Historically, they undermine advancements of black, brown, poor working people. So Michelle, just a second ago, you spoke about how systematic racism has reared its head over and over again in the way that we look at housing and it might come bubble to the top when we're looking at overt uh, discrimination on a case by case basis. But this is the Brooklyn panel. We got smart people in the room. We don't go to personality, we go to systems. 
So looking at those systems that are working to uh, undermine people and propagate oppression, Mahogany Brown is taking the floor right now with the perspective about how we are going to look at systemic racism and make that a policy plank to make sure that Brooklyn for president means something meaningful and moving us forward from criminal justice all the way to housing, food, infrastructure, and education. Mahogany, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, that was amazing. I'm voting for you, um, Michelle. Thank you. Uh, when I think of the things that we need to prioritize, especially considering the criminal justice and the uh, the pipeline um, for the, the for-profit prison industry, um, I believe we need to prioritize decarceration, reentry programs for those inmates that have been taken from their families and their communities, dismiss bail funds and return that money to the people, and defund police. Less money into the prisons and more money into community centers, education, houselessness, and food deserts. If we defund police, we can extend opportunities for mental health care. If we defund police, we can apply those funds to affordable housing units. If we defund police, we can eliminate Wi-Fi shortage for low-income families and provide free hardware and connectivity for our citizens in this borough. If we defund police, which I think uh, it's a $6 billion law enforcement budget, just by half, just by half, we can afford um, community accountability programs that serve as liaisons that put the community members in spaces where they can speak for themselves. We can afford health care and assistance for essential workers. We can provide free food delivery for communities suffering from food deserts instead of the one billion that's already retracted. If we take two more of those billions, uh, we can fund communities and people that are underserved, underserved and ignored. Defunding the police will also serve as a catalyst for humane training, community accountability, and the disintegration of a system designed to disregard Black and Brown people. Redesigning the justice systems begins with sectors working closely with people. Abolish prisons, defund police, redistribute the money to the people that have been systematically abused by these systems of oppression. It isn't enough to condemn, stop, and frisk. We must eliminate the structures that put them there in place in the first place. So close Rikers, do not reform, shut it down. Release all those convicted with marijuana related offenses and low crime offenses. And even those with these high level offenses, we need to start thinking, what do they need as a community, right? Someone said earlier about holistically, and it can't just be us looking at these metal steel bars and taking them from their families and thinking that that will do it. Prison has not worked. We have watched it, it doesn't work. It has tremors and effects. It impacts children and mothers for centuries, like literally centuries. I lost my father to prison 30 years now. That is over half of my life. Um, if I'm correct, there's almost half a million people, innocent people that are imprisoned every day because they can't afford bail. Uh, so it is up to us to demand what our community needs, what we want um, to see happen decarcerate, release all the people and their children from detention centers, close Rikers, close ICE now. Mahogany, I want to ask you what your working definition of defunding the police is. Because if I'm standing on one corner in one part of Brooklyn, I hear a narrative. If I'm standing on another, in another part of Brooklyn, I'm hearing a narrative. So give us your essence beginning and end of what defunding the police is. Again, they have a $6 billion budget, cut that in half, and then you start instilling that money and redistributing that money to people who can work in mental health um, care spaces, people who are already in the community, working with the community. There are account account accountability people that we have access to, but they don't have the actual, um, not say power, but agency. Mm -hmm. They don't have the agency to advocate for what we need. Um, and so you have taught, um, generations of folks to believe that the police will, is, are there here to protect and serve us. But what we're finding is the people that are here to protect and serve us are actually afraid of us. And because they're working from a space of fear, they also then work from a, a space of um, just, you know, uh, eliminate. They, they do not de-escalate, they eliminate. And so we need that money 
cut that cut that six billion dollars in half and start redistributing to folks who have certification, who have a mm -hmm. knowledge, who don't have a fear of the people that they are serving. So you've heard two sides of a very not dissimilar coin once again. I'm going to ask you the ever unfair question right now. Please put the poll up and uh, folks at home who are watching along who are still mad at me that I'm making it an either or proposition. I thought you would have relaxed by now, but you're going to be mad for about another half hour because I'm asking our folks to decide right now between housing or racism clap slash criminal justice as the third and final policy plank as we march towards wrapping up this platform and Brooklyn for president in this first ever Brooklyn caucus. I'm being told in my ear that we're waiting for one more person to vote. So someone on our panel, Ray Gomes, it's, it's a secret ballot. I'm not looking at you. So someone has pressed the button and I can tell you with certainty that the final policy plank in the Brooklyn caucus is housing. So housing as a right, as a responsibility of the Republic has Sorry, won. Let's further it. We'll do it. So, so at this point, I want to outline just what our, uh, what the three policy planks of this whole endeavor are. We've got the most recent one, which was housing. Prior to housing, we had the policy plank of, help me out, Ro, uh, we had housing, we've had healthcare, and we've also had education. So those are the three policy planks. So now I'd like to draw your attention to one more video. Have a look at this word on the street. Okay, so we have those three policy planks. Skip the video where I wanna keep you in the room while it's hot. I have a surprise for you. With full respect to all of the intersectionality that is happening and all of the folks who are upset about uh, these binary choices that we've been forced to make, but you know, it bees that way sometimes. I have the ability to bring something back from the sidelines and add a fourth plank to the policy. So can I please have the poll for the folks in the room? And I would love for everyone at home who is, or wherever you happen to be, to uh, join me in saying right now, we have infrastructure in the economy versus, but not really versus, it's like versus uh, Aretha, I'm sorry, versus Patty and Gladys in the room. It wasn't versus, it was like a getting together. So when I say, these things are verses, it's verses. So infrastructure that we're looking at, we have those three things. So I'm being told that it's a tie between the economy and the racism and criminal justice intersection. So those are the two things that are tied, food insecurity fell by the wayside and in the event of a tie, as there are five of you here, I get to do the Mike Pence of it all, sorry for the reference, and be the tie breaker. There's no flies in the room or on my head that I'm aware of, but I'm gonna get to make the decision. So if those of you who are watching and who've been yelling at me the whole time in the YouTube, you can let me know right now, I'm gonna take the first person and let them sway my vote. Because if I'm given a choice between, keep me honest, what is it, Ro? I'm looking at a difference between the economy and racism. I'm looking at something. Well, I got one vote for racism in the comments and one of my favorite people in Brooklyn told me to choose the economy. In the, in the chat that I'm looking at here. So it's the economy. 
I had three voices for racism and for the economy. So wow. our policy plank is secure. So it's going to be the economy. I would just say that even when the economy is good, racism still re re you know, rears its ugly head. Somebody say that. So I'm going to invite all of you to unmute your microphones right now since there are no more presentations. And let's dialogue about this platform that we've built. I'm getting uh, folks who are Skyping in with me on YouTube, letting me know things that we've missed and what their thoughts of. In fact, I have one more video that I would like to share about someone who is going to be upset because the uh, racism didn't quite make it into the final round. Can I share that video with the folks? Okay. All right. So uh, we are just going to keep it moving here. So I'm going to ask each of you to weigh in right now. We've got a policy. We've got a policy that includes the economy. We've got a policy that includes moving forward with uh, health care. So I want to know from you if there, if there is anything we left out, these first among equals, is this going to be enough to bring Brooklyn forward as Brooklyn for president? Can we win on this platform? Nadia, I saw you sharing some support for points that Ray was bringing up, talking about how you've lived this intersection between education and food justice and educating your young people and families and working in collaboration with some great organizations in Brooklyn to bring food justice to your community. Um, yeah, I think that what I stated in our internal um, chat on Zoom is that you can't have one without the other. Um, and for me, like it's, it's so hard to choose any of these things by itself because we're all impacted by all of the issues that we've all represented um, this evening, which is why I figured out as an educator how to interweave these things. Um, because what we do see in the education system is that we tend to only focus on one particular thing without realizing that, you know, we are a microcosm of what's happening in the world. And if we fail to um, take time to address these issues, then we make one particular person, one particular class, one particular race more important than really looking at it from a humanities perspective. Um, so, you know, as I, as I listened to Mahogany share about all of the things as it related to racism and the criminal justice system, you know, my mantra has always been, I opened the school to close a prison. And you know, Brownsville is one of those communities that adds to the 80% of the people, the residents who end up in our New York state prisons. And so that's based off of um, housing insecurities. That's based off of the fact that we have food insecurities. That's based off of the fact that our economy is not well in a community like Brownsville. People are not being taught trades, right? We focus so much on getting them to college, but our education system isn't reflective of the needs of our children. And so we've taken trade out of the school. We're a creative people, right? If we had things in place where we're not just saying to children, you have to wait until they go to high school to find out about coding. You have to go to high school to find out about um, things in the fashion industry. They could be learning things right now. Kids are quick learners, right? And yeah. so for me, that's why education is always that place um, that we could connect all things. But there's a creative way that we can do that. And the reason why I take a stance with education, because even on a national platform, you hear that education is not even a priority. They don't talk about <laughs> about it. And when they do speak on it, they only talk about it from the perspective of school choice. And what that means is charter school choices or vouchers for private schools or independent schools. But at the end of the day, you don't give neighborhood choice because if those residents of those communities that are underserved and underprivileged had the choice of living somewhere else, they would go somewhere else. So instead of doing that, when we talk about you know, defunding the police, I think that oftentimes, and I appreciate you asking Mahogany to explain it, because people take it as what's being said is to take all of the funding from the police. 
it is really saying it needs to be appropriately funded for, you know, yes, have we need our police department, but what do we need them for? If someone is having a mental health crisis, you do not need to dispatch the police. What you need to do is get someone of the mental health care field who is mm -hmm. licensed, who can help with that individual in a crisis, right? And so people get in their emotions and their feelings and they're saying that people of color are asking or those who are in a specific party are asking to end <laughs> the careers of police officers. No, that what we're saying is essentially let's reallocate funding. And if that makes you feel better, reallocate funding, refund education, refund healthcare, you know, refund mental health, refund housing. Let's use those words. If that makes you feel better, right. then let's refund the places that need to be funded. So we're, we're shifting ideas by languaging ourselves into a better understanding. So if defund the police makes you feel a kind of way, say refund housing, refund infrastructure, refund food justice. Mahogany spoke to us about the tune of $3 billion that would still leave a more than robust uh, budget in many people's opinions for policing in the city. So I'm looking at you, Randy, Michelle, and Ray saying, what would a $3 billion reinvestment in each of your respective fields yield? If you had $3 billion plowed into making more affordable housing stock or creating better plans to sustain short biz, uh, small businesses throughout this economic rough patch or get people out of the cycle of emergency food into sustainable health and food, what would $3 billion look like in each of those lanes? I just want to make a quick point too, because I feel like even though racism and economy didn't make it into the final, that those two things underpin a lot of these issues. We have food insecurity because of racism. We have um, food insecurity because of our our inequitable distribution of resources through our economy. We saw main moves and a lot of people who said that, you know, the fundamentals of this U.S. economy were built on racism and the- It was ba based on slavery. Right. Really? Our economy was based on slavery. And so the, you know, joining the racism with the economy, you know, our food industry, our agricultural industry began really in earnest with, ra with, with slavery and with the dispossession of people um, from one land and bringing them here through violence. Um, and so with the $3 billion, I mean, I can see so many community food sovereignty projects being um, maintained and funded, but, you know, I definitely don't don't want to take policy out of this because policy is such a huge critical part of our lives that we don't necessarily give it a lot of um, a lot of energy and understanding. Um, you know, I could add food to basically every single part of this platform, particularly with education. Um, if you knew that um, all of this, all of the subsidies that go to agricultural products were are for corn, dairy, soy, and wheat. And those are the foods, those are the fillers in the food of highly processed food. And that is the most easily accessible and affordable food all around us, right? Mm -hmm. You would see how our policy is really created to have us have poor health outcomes, right? And so the education, when I was you know, responding to what Nadia was saying in terms of including food justice as a part of our education, it's not just telling young people that you need to eat more kale or you need to eat more fresh fruits and vegetables. It's really having them understand how the system is really set up for them to not be successful mm -hmm. and how you know, being an activist and being you know, rebelling against the system, which teenagers love to do, is really a way of, of creating better health for yourself and for your community, right? Um, so specialty foods, things like fre fresh fruits and vegetables, the things that we promote for people to eat more of, those things aren't subsidized, right? You did a wonderful piece on Brenda Duchesne out in Brownsville, um, who grows food for the community for, I, I guess it's like close to 20 years that she's been doing this work. Uh, $3 billion could, 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 could help support the work that she is doing, could uplift the work that she's doing. I'm part of Central Brooklyn Food Co-op to start a food cooperative in Bed-Stuy, in, in Central mm -hmm. Brooklyn. There's efforts around starting a Central Brooklyn food hub, right, to recreate the food distribution system that benefits the community, that the community have access. And so not have profit be the bottom line, but community health be the bottom line, right? 
all of that money can go towards those efforts because that will directly impact education and the understanding of the community. It will benefit, it will impact um, the food access, but it will also impact um, educate, um, sorry, uh, professional uh, opportunities, economic ec opportunities for the community now and in the future. So as we are looking at what we chose as our policy planks, I'm wondering, Randy, taking a look at how this comports with what the two major candidates that take up a lot of space are running on, what's at stake for Brooklyn? And how could the discrepancies between our policy planks and what they give a lot of energy to affect us really on the ground here? Well, <clears throat> Let me let me put it to you this way: the small business infrastructure or ecosystem is at stake, nothing less, right? We've never seen a crisis of this magnitude, and small businesses are disproportionately impacted by the shutdown. Look, if you have to roll up a gate every day at 5 a.m., right, uh, versus you know people who have the ability to work from their home in Westchester. Uh, remotely, there's a very big difference there. If your purpose is to really serve your community and you have to see your customer base because they're there every day to access a product or a service, right? That's the types of businesses that we're talking about. And I've done 25 commercial corridor tours since phase one reopening. I've been to Brownsville three times. We did Belmont, we did Pitkin, uh, and we did the food distribution event with for President Adams. Uh, and I, I, will, I will say this, three things come up, grants, not loans, real rent relief for commercial tenants. And the third thing that has really come up is uh, overzealous enforcement uh, as a means to close the budget gap is not helpful to the small business community. And that's what they're facing right now. So, you know, for $3 billion, right, we could, we could solve one and two, right? We can give grants, not loans to small businesses, right? Uh, and we can help them with real rent relief uh, on the commercial rent side because commercial rent, 48% of which our small businesses are behind on, uh, according to our survey, is the largest fixed cost for a small business, no matter where that small business is. So, you know, these are the things that we could uh, reinvest that funding on uh, in order to shore up and frankly save our small business ecosystem uh, throughout Brooklyn, which once again, to put it into scale, 63,000 businesses across all of the communities employing more than half of the New Yorkers uh, and all of which, uh, or 84% of which have less than 10 employees. So that's the types of businesses that we're talking about. So every, as everyone's mics are open right now, we know that you all have very particular levels of expertise and are known in certain fields, but as a part of this process, we asked you to come at us with some issues. So I would love to hear each of you share something that you prioritize outside of what we all know you for, because none of you stayed in so narrow a lane as to say, oh, Nadia, I'm only concerned with education. Michelle, I'm only concerned with housing. We know that you're multifaceted people who see all of the connections between all of these things, as we've repeatedly said this evening. So I'm asking one of you to unmute now, or all of you, and step out and share something that you think we should be prioritizing and holding our leaders accountable for right now as we continue this season of voting that's going to lead to a new mayor and a large part of the city council flipping and community boards and all of the things. How do we hold them accountable for something besides what we know you all best for? Well, on the federal level, I would say immigration reform. We need we need immigration reform, and we need to look. We've we've done a full 180 under this administration in terms of immigration policy. If that was even possible, because we still hadn't had passed immigration reform prior, we've closed our borders. We have we have come down hard on on immigrants who are here. We have got no path to citizenship for people who have been productive citizens in this country for decades. And it's just ridiculous. And P.S. It hurts our economy. So just to tie it back to the economy, it totally undermined our economy. So you know, I would say immigration reform, real immigration reform, just immigration reform, a return to the policies of an open door in the United States are really something that uh, should be on the federal platform. And so, I'll just leave. 
Does anyone else want to uh, share an issue that folks might not immediately recognize as something that's in your wheelhouse? But I see you coming on, Michelle. Well, I don't know if it's necessarily in, in my wheelhouse, but um, I, I don't think we can underestimate how important it is for the federal government to come up with additional assistance for states, for you know, municipalities and, and states. I mean, the only, the only part of government that can print money is the federal government, right? Um, and, uh, you know, everybody is kind of like, you know, why can't, you know, the governor do this or why can't the mayor do that? Well, in the end, like, that, that's a unique power that it's at the federal level. And, um, you know, it, it, the federal government exacerbated this pandemic. Like, their, their, you know, incredibly poor response, right, has made it much worse, which is just prolonging the pain. And if we don't, you know, provide a lifeline to states and municipalities, like all the things we just talked about are all going to cut, be cut and go away, right? So it's like critically important that we like shore up the foundation um, or else, you know, everything's going to come crumbling down. So Mahogany, in the spirit of flipping the entire narrative, you had a comment that you shared among us that I would love for you to bring to the front as we're standing in line to vote for a system that hasn't done a lot to respect a lot of us for a long time, but vote, but still, mahogany. Vote and, <laughs> uh, yeah, I just said I prioritize continuing with the spirit of an anarchist jurisdiction. Uh, the fact that that's what they call New York City is hilarious and <laughs> why not? Let's let's keep up that, that good effort, folks. Uh, Sanctuary is one of our greatest attributions, and that is why uh, there are so many um, naysayers for, for the, the New York state of mind. I love it. So to that end, the world is watching New York, and by extension, we know that means Brooklyn. Whether we are the poster boy for someone who might go to use us as a battering ram to divide a country or show an example of what this anarchist jurisdiction looks like, the great tire fire we've seen for the last four years, but I'm wondering how Brooklyn can lead by example. We had a comment on YouTube from one person that said, you know, Brooklyn's greatest strength is that we can show the rest of the world how it can be done. So what thing can we show as a Brooklyn collective? We had housing, healthcare, education, and the economy emerge as the issues that we're about to walk through the door and present to our convention floor. But how can Brooklyn lead and show the rest of the world how it's done? Don't make me call Eric Adams back. <laughs> Go ahead, Nadia. Um, so I struggle with answering this question because as everyone was speaking, especially with the previous question, was like, but how are our elected officials right now showing up? Because at the end of the day, um, how we as a borough sh uh, really can shine and be a model is based off of those who are in the position right now to shape the policies, to make sure funding is allocated appropriately, to protect those that they have been voted to serve. You know, um, a lot of people give a lot of talk. A lot of people when the timing is right and they wanna be elected for a particular position, they take a stance, they're in every photo op, they're, they're doing all that they need to do. But people are hurting, right? We're in a time when we need leadership. And so what you're finding is the community, the community is becoming their own leaders. The community is speaking out, the community is marching, the community is demanding, right? But we're the people that were elected to take that stance. And so if Brooklyn is supposed to show up, the Brooklyn representatives need to show up. And you know, I, I folks know me and I always say, I measure you by how you show up for my kids. And a lot of people haven't, right? They didn't show up for my scholars. Um, and we we created and we figured it out. But we we can be that place because Brooklyn is always a thoroughborough. That's what I've always said. Um, and we show up and show out. Um, and we take no shorts, right? And, and we're, we're, we're the land of kings and queens. And so the people who stand for us, who are supposed to represent us, need to show up and do their job. So 
I would like to take it back to the summer that I spent socially distanced on the sidewalks of Brooklyn, running up and down into people from Brownsville to Bay Ridge, downtown Brooklyn, folks standing in line waiting to exercise their civil responsibility and right to vote. I had a simple question. I asked them, finish this statement for me. If I were president, and I'm gonna put that to each of you in closing tonight. So Ray, you're over here in my box. I'm gonna ask you to finish the statement. If I were president. I would put people over profits. Short and sweet. Plain and simple. <laughs> <laughs> I got a round of applause and two taps in a circle. <laughs> Michelle De La Uz, if I were president, I would help our country um, have a reckoning with our history of systemic racism so we can actually move forward and go beyond it. That reckoning. In the spirit of that anarchist energy that Mahogany was talking about. Principal Lopez, I need you to wax poetic on the subject of, if I were president, Unmuted. <laughs> I would shut it down. No, I would, um, I believe it's always uh, people over profit, purpose over power and understanding the power is supposed to be in the people um, and stand firm and in, in, in confronting our lives so that we can get to our troops. So that's where I would be at. Mahogany, you know, we were coming to you. Give us some of your thoughts while out. We've got some time here. If you could uh, let us know what it would be like for an unbought, unbossed woman to occupy that highest office. If I were president. Um, if I were president, short and sweet, recenter the struggle, the voice, and the story of the single mother. Mm. I think we uh, have the topic of our next town hall there <laughs> and, and all of the things that you, uh, you all shared tonight. So thank you for all of the time that you spent with us. And Randy, we want to know what you would do. I didn't forget about you. I was just caught up in the steam of that recent recenter and single mothers that touched me in a way. Uh, Randy, if I were president, lay it out for us. I would, I would never hold to absolutes because I learned that there's almost, there's truth in every perspective. And the minute we close off our minds and our hearts to any other perspective, we are fully lost. So that's, I know it's counter to what presidents usually do and say or any elected official, but don't hold to absolutes because there are really none in life. I just want to take a moment to acknowledge all of the people who've been uh, so robust in their comments on our YouTube page. I see all of you. Thank you for being such an involved and engaged members of the community, knowing that we are all suffering from little box fatigue. The way that you all have uh, shown up and really kept the voice in the Be Heard series. You know, we do these town halls quarterly and we're used to being together and we will be together again, but we're shifting the way that we're doing things. We're not losing our connection. We're just maintaining our distance. So thank you for always keeping us honest and keeping your opinions going. We see you and we appreciate all of those things so much. So I want to uh, thank all of the panelists for sharing their time and some of their quarantine hours with us. It's been an enlightening conversation and we hope to continue it in those uh, panels and on our stoops and in our text and finger typing. And before we get out of here, I just want to uh, extend a debt of gratitude to everyone who put this together. And I'm going to ask them something that is unplanned and maybe a little unfair, depending on how you're feeling tonight. But if you are a member of the BRIC staff or supporting folks, I want you to turn on your camera right now so I'm people like, can get a glimpse <laughs> as to what it's like to put this thing together. You get to hear my big mouth, but people have made it all possible. There's so many more people and they're all being shy right now. 
There's my producer, Ro Johnson, who was the 91-year-old grandmother who put her ballot in the mailbox. I'm looking at Stephen Arnold, who runs operations over here on our production team. Michael Carroll left his family to get into a room. And that's Eric Hazegag. Marcus Kearns is the voice who's been in my ear and switching all these things. Amanda Harrington has been in touch with all of our panelists and keeping me on track with research. Anna's not turning on her camera. You've seen Eddie and our other interpreter. Thank you so much to Eddie and Debbie for making sure that members of the uh, deaf community could be able to take place and uh, take part in this robust conversation. Dave Feldman is somewhere out on the shore there showing us a picture. But this is just a small sample of all the people who were sit-ins and really helped to shape and craft this. The staff and team at Brick TV and Brick as an organization are phenomenal. And always, there's Dave, make us look so much better than we deserve to on this side of the camera. So thank you to my partner in all of this, Ro Johnson, for all these years of hard work and dedication that you've put into this. It's gone on too long, but I had to pour out into them all that they poured into me for so long. And Amanda, thank you for being so hardworking and dedicated. And I know I'm going on at length, but what some of you may not know is that I am uh, leaving my full-time capacity at Brick TV and I'm gonna be transitioning into another position at another fine organization, still doing the work. I've, uh, I've accepted a position with the folks at Consumer Reports, uh, the national magazine where I'm going to be the deputy of special projects there, focusing on marketplace inequities. So I'm still with you all. I'm gonna be reporting and investigating the stories that impact our community and uh, sharing them with the world. So I'll always be in touch. I hope you continue to be in touch with me. Thank you so much, Brooklyn. You are my home and my life and my community. I really appreciate everything you've done. Thank you, Jonathan Ortiz, popping in there now. It's Hello, the America. How you doing? My name is Marilyn Sanchez, so and I am from much. Brownsville, Brooklyn, <laughs> New York. All right. Good one, night, two, one, two. Thank you so much. If I was voted for Goodbye. president, I would follow the agenda Bye. of we the people because that's what the Constitution says. We the people, not turning the, dub, the W into a M and saying me the people. If I was president, I would simply just say no capitalism and no college. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Dave. I'm 45. I'm a dad. Uh, if I were president, I would tax the billionaires, give everyone free health care and free Wi-Fi. And I'd make sure that like it's a law that the Star Wars movies have to be good because they've been really disappointing. <laughs> it's probably like an executive order. I don't have to go through Congress for that. So. Huh? If I were president, I would unify the country. I think we're living in divisive times. And I think that it's imperative that black people, white people, gay people, straight people come together. So that way we can beat this pandemic. And I believe that that would be my first uh, mission, I guess, if I were president. If I was president, the first thing I would do is get rid of Citizens United. We need to take out all the money out of politics. Number two, I would probably socialize medicine because healthcare is a right. I would remove the the real estate industry because housing is a right. Um, those are the first things I would do if I was president. Um, if I were president, I would give everybody free housing and health care and food. If I were president, I would add several seats to the Supreme Court so that Republicans can stop blocking legislation that does just that. Um, if I were president, I would have free education and free health care for everybody. The number one thing used to be climate change was number one on my agenda, but what I've realized through this election cycle is the number one thing to me is democracy. And so it has to be about giving everybody the right to vote easily. We talk about making a plan to vote. To be honest, that is bullshit. We should not have to make a plan to vote. Voting should be the simplest thing. If I were president, uh, one of the first things I would do in the first hundred days of office is try to dismantle some of the mistrust um, that the public has for institutions. As president, I would end racism, social just injustices, and social inequalities in healthcare, education, housing, income, immigration, sexism, LGBT 
women's rights. Hi, I am Ishla from Brooklyn. I am the best thing in the world. I'm an African-American woman, Jamaican descent, and I'm from Brooklyn. If I was president of this country, I would address our babies, make sure that they're healthy, make sure they're safe, that they're well-educated, because that's the future.